Hello. Hello, hello. Hi, everybody. All right. We are going to just wait a couple of minutes for people to trickle in, and then we will get started. Okay, Lauren. That looks good. Yeah. So I hope everybody's ready for a, a great bartender, great mixologist, and a lesson. <laughs> We're gonna have yeah. fun. You're gonna have yeah, fun. Yeah, it's gonna, gonna be a good day. What time is it over there for you? Ah, it's uh, 8 p.m. If I'm right, I never know which time it is because I stay so long in my office. I never know. <laughs> it's so, 8 o'clock. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. 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 You're, you're six hours behind me, my dear, because you're yes. in DC. You are in much Canada. better with the time zones than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing that for 30 years. I have no merit. That's fair. That's fair. Yes. All right. Yeah, let's get started. Let's get started. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for Portland Cocktail Week Distance Learning. I am Lauren Paylor, and this is Benedict Hardy. Uh, we're coming to you from uh, Hardy Cognac, and uh, I'm excited to chat with Miss Benedict today. Um, we have some really interesting topics that we will be covering um, from intersectionality, advancement, cultural exchange. So we have... Um, a vast uh, uh, amount of uh, topics and uh, conversation that will be occurring, but uh, yeah, I will. Uh, I'll let Benedict introduce herself, and then we can get started. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's going to be an interesting hour, I think. Um, it's really the first time that Lush Life uh, with Lauren gives us this opportunity to present Hardy Cognac. Well, my company started in um, 1863. I'm the fifth generation of that uh, company, but I've been around the block a few times, if I can say that, because uh, the United States have definitely been the, the market that I have favored and worked the hardest at uh, for many years. Um, it is true that uh, the physiognomy of the company today has nothing to do with what my great great grandfather created. Uh, he was born and raised like, a, like an Englishman and uh, decided that he loved this, this industry and this area so much that he wanted to change his life around and start a business on his own. And that happened in 1863. So we have been fortunate enough that I'm, I'm the only one of the family left. I have a sister, but she's in the wine business. And over the years, it's, it's hard when you are a smaller company to keep really um, to present yourself and being different. So my father in the 80s chose a, a different angle. Uh, he came uh, with the idea of um, selling uh, what my great-great-grandfather had put aside before the phylloxera crisis. The phylloxera is an insect that came from the United States, as a matter of fact, in vines and destroyed 95% of the vineyards in France. Um, so that means that the genuine grapes for Armagnac and Cognac, for instance, are not the same that we're using today. Very few are left, but so we were fortunate enough in my company and my family that my father had um, kept uh, this heirloom from his great great grandfather, and that's really what starting in 1981 um, the reputation of Hardy as quality and rarity. So what you see behind me is part of that collection. It was called Perfection, very modestly. And out of these uh, 3,600 bottles that we had in 1981, 32 remain today. And the five one that you see on the top of the shelves here um, represent the five elements. We started with water, then we went to fire, air, earth, and the fifth one, which is the only one available today, is light in the air. So over the years, the angle and the, this angle co continued we decided at the time to pair with uh, and to marry with a Dome Crystal Company, which is located in Lorraine, in the east of France. But my dream was to go um, with another very unique and uh, beautiful crystal maker, uh, which is Lalique. And you see one of them of the four seasons that we have created. The four months winter will be out in three months from now. This is summer in the back with the, the yellow honey color. And this also has been really my, this is my heirloom. My, the other one was my father's and this is what uh, we have created with our team, uh, with the Lalique people. And it's, it's exceptional to be the cognac of choice for, for these people with, 
who have, you know, Patron in tequila, Macallan in scotch, and um, to name a few. Uh, so, and Beluga in vodka. So over the years with the, the craftsmanship of um, our blender, um, Michael Bouillie, his name is, uh, we have come with new ideas and new ways of promoting cognac. For me, the mixology is not something that I take lightly. Reason why I did participate for the first time at this cocktail week in Portland, and I was extremely impressed. impressed. Of course, I had been to, uh, uh, to Tales of the Cocktails that I like very much, but it's huge, and sometimes it's difficult to focus on every event and attend all the parties. In, in, in Oregon, it was a little more focused, and, and we did a special event uh, for Legend, for the cognac that Lauren is going to use tonight. And that's this cognac is the reason why we're here today. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah, I had the pleasure of meeting Benedict uh, last year at Portland Cocktail Week when I competed yeah. in the competition. And, uh, you know, and I, I, I referenced this moment a lot, but I, I was really surprised to win. And you're always like, oh, you were surprised. And it was, it was a very fun experience. And I think it really displays um, the importance of, um, creating a bond and a relationship with the people who are involved with the product. It, it provides you with a greater appreciation um, for the, the products as bartenders that we use in our cocktails and our drinks. And um, what and was wonderful also, sorry to interrupt, is no, that okay. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the finalist, you know, for this cocktail, there were three ladies, which was really amazing. So really... Of course, I fell in love with Lauren and her glasses. Who can resist her glasses? <laughs> but, but we had such a bond and immediate bond. And she was so surprised to win, you know, when we announced the prize. She was uh, moved and I was moved too because it's yeah. a bond of culture. It's a bond of race. It's a bond of, of quality of life, of enjoying good things. And that's, that's what mattered the most for me. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And speaking of cocktails, I have one that I'm going to make for you all today, and then we'll get into um, some of these topics. But I'm going to be using our um, Hardy Legends Cognac, which is uh, the one that was featured in that competition last year. Uh, Bennett, do you want to talk a little bit about like the, the sure. taste? Sure. Le Legend is, le you know, in, rec in cognac houses, you have to understand that, of course, um, um, you carry what people understand as far as names. Uh, VS is probably the most common, which means very special, which means it has been aged for two years in oak, VSOP for four years. And legend is the category um, which is in between the XO, which legally is 10 years, and, and the VSOP. So in order to make it very special, uh, our blender decided to use the oak, the limousine oak that we get from the French forest in a different way. It shows um, a darker roast toast. And that's how uh, we get from this product, uh, coffee, uh, marmalade, uh, roasted nuts, mocha flavors, cappuccino. Mm -hmm. And it shows so well in cocktails. That's, that's really something that we wanted to bring to the American public for under $50. Yes. So it's a, it's a reasonable uh, product for something that has been aged for the youngest in the blend four years and for the oldest 12 years. Yeah, so um, speaking of those like tasting characteristics and notes, I ended up making an orange marmalade coffee um, syrup. Uh, so I took marmalade, equal parts marmalade, um, I took coffee, and then I added uh, another part of our turbinado sugar with a just a teaspoon of like vanilla extract and um, uh, two ounces of our hearty cognac and then a couple of dashes of aromatic bitters and we have a lovely old fashioned. So, you know, just treating the cognac the same way I would treat any other aged spirit. And then I have uh, this lovely drink. Look, right at, look at the color, beautiful. Yeah. So it's interesting that you're making an old fashioned because I'm sure that for many of you listening uh, today, um, old fashioned for you, it's bourbon or scotch, but it's not cognac. Well, before prohibition um, in your country, I would say 60 to 70 percent of the good cocktails, the Sazerac of the world, the, the sidecars, uh, the, the French 75 and the old fashioned were made with cognac. 
During prohibition, of course, uh, European products were not accessible. So it becomes obvious that people traded for vodka, gin, even moonshine sometimes, you know, which is back into fashion now, um, whatever they could put their hands on. Um, the mixology world today has placed real products back on the map. You see now cocktails that are made with chartreuse. You, are, you see wonderful, wonderful old-fashioned Italian, French, Swiss liqueurs, which had totally disappeared from the map. And I think that the customers, particularly because when you want, before, you know, having a cocktail on the rocks and a martini, I mean, a, a martini with a vodka, it was an experience, but nothing like having an old fashioned like uh, Lauren just did prepared or, or uh, it's, it's, it's a totally different experience. So now people want a story behind that cocktail. Yeah. And the ingredient, you're doing your own bitters, you're doing your own simple syrups, you're doing all these things uh, which make your cocktail shine. And people, you don't have to have many to be happy, but one good cocktail will make your event and your evening. Really. Absolutely. I agree. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, we talked a little bit about friendships earlier and, um, you know, celebrating differences and this idea of intersectionality. And obviously we're two individuals that come from two different parts of the world, you know, sure. two very different backgrounds. And, um, you know, I wanted to touch a little bit about the importance of celebrating these differences, right? Um, and, and the things that make us unique and how that ultimately allows um, us to be in a position um, to encourage others to, you know, support uh, in the same way. I, th I think you have to, I think today, particularly in this day and age where, where um, separation and hatred messages and everything, and you see sometimes social network can be really hard on people. I think the first thing is to believe in yourself. I can tell you my own experience. I was, of course, born in this cognac family, um, but I was trained as a lawyer. I was I like school, I was good in school. And when it was time for me to go in my professional life, I realized that I would have hated to be a lawyer because I was very interested in my father's business. But in fact, I had never dared to ask, which was very interesting. Um, and, and at the beginning, I remember I chose the United States because it was the only country where women could talk freely. Uh, you was, it was not possible 30 years ago when I started to go to even Japan, which is a great country, but women were not supposed to be professional, a and not to mention the rest of Asia. A and so my choice was naturally the United States. But the first, the first tasting that I did, um, I was in front of 30 men. So I showed up. My name is Benedict. For many American people, Benedict is a man. It's not a woman. Well, in my country, it's only for women. It's an E at the end. So I show up and I start to explain. Uh, and I have a question, this guy in front of me. You can see they have a lot of doubts of what I'm telling them. <laughs> and so this guy is asking me, he said, how many Demi Johns do you have in your parody, which is the, the best place where we keep our old cognacs? Demi John is a word that I'd never heard before. And it's only the translation of Dame John. And there was another gentleman, an older gentleman at the first row, who saw that I was very embarrassed because I looked like a total fool. I didn't, I didn't have an answer. I didn't understand the question. And he said, oh, he's asking you about the Dame John. And suddenly, you know, light in the room and everything. And everybody's laughing. And I said, oh, we have a lot. And I tried to explain. Because, you know, sometime like that, when you're a rookie, which I was, you know, some things, you know, can put, throw you off. Ah, of course. So I, that was an experience. But so I understand what young women like you, uh, and particularly colored young women, can can go through difficulties, you know, to, to get to get their name established and their expertise recognized. So I am always trying to help. I have considerable admiration for women in our business because let's say men have it much easier. It's it's no question. I'm not trying to play like everybody says, oh, yes, of course, she's playing the same tune, women first, women power. I do believe that women are good at what they do. They're very thorough, and they have to work so much harder to be successful. Um, it is true today, and it was even truer 
and my generation. Uh, my mentors, you know, in my industry were Mrs. Dominique Herriard du Breuil. She was the head of Remy Martin, uh, one of the best cognac houses and top cognac houses. And she was the leader, you know. And it was something for me. I said, well, if she did it, maybe can I do it, you know. And you need like that people that um, really bring an example and show you the way. Uh, Mrs. Cointreau, also for Frappin Cognac, same thing. Um, and Mrs. Dominique Heria had a blender and, and a master, a cellar master, and a lady. Her name was Pierre Trichet. Can you imagine a team of two ladies leading in this <laughs> dance world? So when I see young mixologists like you, I say, well, that's fantastic. And I'm not going to play, you know, the game, man against woman. That's not the point. I think we can bring something to each other. And for me, this is really the message that I want to say. Believe in yourself. If you are behind the screen tonight, today, tonight for me, but today for you, um, just believe in yourself. If you think that you have some talent, some skills to blend things and to make them good, go for it. Because today you have more luck and more opportunities than you had even 10 years ago. Yeah, I agree. And I think the thing that's just so amazing about how you know, entering the competition and then, you know, this, uh, us being able to form a friendship, it just proves that it doesn't matter, you know, how different individuals are or like where they are. And, uh, if there, if there is a, uh, an underlying, um, connection that it will be there. And I, I, I love what you said earlier about, you know, um, believing in yourself and advocating for others, because I think it's important that we realize and understand that we also were in their position at some point in time and we needed somebody to lend a hand to ourselves. Right. Um, yeah, and I, I'm interested in talking a little bit about authenticity of like self, right, and finding your voice. And I imagine um, there were some difficulties along the way, but um, you know, I, I know for me in my own personal journey, journey, that's something that is relatively new. And um, I think that along the way, there were some bumps in the road, and I, I'm finally very comfortable and and um, uh, in a position where I can really advocate for others to do the same and just just interested in kind of talking about that any journey uh, difficulties you you know encountered in, during your journey and how you found your voice yeah well I had difficulties because I'm a very um, I trust you know you shake my hand and for me that's that's it and unfortunately not everybody is like that so I've had some disappointments <laughs> I've had yeah. some uh, bad experiences I mean that's how you learn. And unfortunately, my parents tried to warn me, but they, the parents always try to protect you. You know, they like to be the, the wall that protects. But you realize, uh, unfortunately, I lost my mother at a young age. And um, it's, it's tough now because I'm this one. I'm, I have this role for my children. Um, I'm hoping that my daughter will follow my path in the future. She's only 21, um, but I hope that she will learn. But I'm always telling her that, it's not where you come from that matters the most. It's where you want to go. And if you have a goal, there is a way. If you have a way, there is, if you have a vision, if you have something that you want to succeed, there is no reason why you cannot accomplish that. And for me, that was crucial. So, of course, I've had some difficulties. I've had some uh, bad experiences. But overall, I have to say, and it's, it's the beauty of uh, human beings, you forget the bad memories and you always focus on, on the good ones. And I have been very fortunate. I, you know, I work with a wonderful importer today. I have met, I have some wonderful friends all over the United States. And uh, for me, the toughest part today is not to be able to travel and to hug them. That's, yeah. that's for me. For the first time, Lauren, in my entire professional life, I have spent more than um, eight months off the American market. Never happened to me before. Wow. Never. So, of course, this this conversation that we have, this Zoom and whatever you call them, they're wonderful and frustrating at the same time. At least you you keep contact with your friends, you keep you keep contact with your customers and everything. But at the same time, when you close the computer, you would like more, and you know that you're going to have to be patient because this COVID is a disaster. It's, starting to grow back in, in Europe and in my country, in, in Belgium. Now we're wearing masks. So 
we know that it's not going to go away. It's something you might we might have to live with for a few months or, or even a few years. So I think we have to be patient and make the best out of it. And the best is to drink good things. Yes, it's just I agree. And share these good things with the people you love. I mean, uh, for me, it's crucial. I have been blessed to have two beautiful children, a husband that can really stand by me when I'm traveling so many months out of the year, but um, friends that really enjoy uh, what I'm presenting when I'm making a cocktail and not as talented as you are, but a quick, a quick cocktail and, and having people, you know, just sit back, relax, which is a word that I would like Americans would use more often. You say relax, <laughs> but you don't know how. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, you we were talking about that. Hard. Hard. You we were talking about that. Hard. We do, we do. <laughs> um, so, I want to, yeah, I wanted to ask about, you know, we talked a little bit about traveling and how you were so accustomed and used to coming to the United States. And I wonder, you know, there was obviously a cultural exchange that was occurring. You know, you were coming here and I know you've been coming here for years, but like uh, you were introduced to to our customs and the way that we do things, our food, our, you know, our traditions. And I wonder how you're like upkeeping that during this time. Like, do you have the option or the ability to do that? Yes. Uh, I was, I was, you know, there are so many things that are said about the United States. Like, oh, they have horrible food and all oh, their wines are too that. Or the, and I have discovered that, there is some fantastic things in your country, really. First of all, you have a magnificent country, and I don't think many of you have. Before you go and travel, and it's not that I'm telling you not to come to visit us when it when it is possible, but uh, when you go and tour any part of your country, I mean, it, for me, it has been a, a reason to to really enjoy myself tremendously. Um, you are very welcoming. I mean, most Americans are really welcome you open arms and share with you what they have. And I've discovered that home cooking in this country is very precious. There are some old recipes. I have some friends in Buffalo. She's like my American mother. She was from Italian descent and she blended American custom and Italian food and Cajun and everything. And it's fabulous. I mean, so, um, Yes, there were there were there were some some learning process for me and experience. But you know the the crab season in Maryland, uh, the blue crabs and 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 the snow crab in on the on the west coast and the I mean the the stone crab in in in, in Florida and everything around and your your even your turkey. I would have never imagined <laughs> that I would enjoy the the Thanksgiving turkey because for me the turkey in Europe are much smaller. The first time, it was so funny. I was with an American friend in Buffalo and we were preparing Thanksgiving and he went to buy his turkey and there was this big fridge with all these turkeys and I said, well, they look like dogs, not like turkey. They were huge, huge. So this is a total culture shock. shock. And the, your bars in New York, in D.C. and in, in, in everywhere, in Vegas, how many, I mean, how many different SKUs do you carry? How many different varieties of vodka? Nowhere in the world do you see as many products as you see in the United States. You have the, the best food possible if you want to look for it. And you have amazing array of, because all the world wants to be seen in the United yeah. States. So competition is fierce to get some space. Yeah. On but nevertheless, my experience uh, with with your country has been nothing but extraordinary, really. I love that. And have you been able to continue that now with like the Zoom, or you're obviously limited that you can't physically go there? But um... I think my biggest Zoom, as I told you, is at the same time a great um, a great pleasure because I I can see people and at least we don't lose contact. But it's big frustration because I like to experience things by myself. So not be able to travel and to set foot on the American soil has been a little hard on me. My husband said, you look like a lion in cage, he says. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun. I mean, I, I know I know it's for the best because right now, first of all, the bo your borders are closed to European travelers. So even if I want to come and go through Canada, I would not be able to come to the US. So I have to... Uh, to make the best of it and try to help my importer, uh, Levesque Corporation, and 
try to help their team, you know, to just promote the product. And the numbers are good because we're lucky to have some distribution. And of course, customers are not shopping the same way they did. They, they go with internet, they go, they go with brands they know. So when you have a little distribution, it's easier. To be a young brand today, starting from scratch is much more difficult. Mm -hmm. Because unless you have a tremendous uh, aura of the social uh, media, it's very hard to get a name for yourself in those uh, in those in, in this time and, and end of the day. It's really hard. Yeah, uh, you know the 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 cultural exchange aspect for me is quite interesting. I think that um, you know I haven't traveled much overseas. I've been to Italy once or twice, and Greece once or twice. But I found that this during this time, I you know having these conversations, although it's not um, as personal, I've, yeah. I've, there's been great value for me because I've been able to establish connections um, with people overseas, and you know there there's and there's just so many bartenders overseas and um, so much talent and so many bars and restaurants I'd never heard of. So uh, this has actually been a very enlightening um, experience. Additionally, just hearing, you know, some of the, if we're being really honest, some of the struggles that they've had and being able to talk about them openly and honestly and, um, you know, and, and it's comforting in many ways, you know, although yes. this yeah. has been a very difficult time, there's something about acknowledging and realizing that we're all in this together and that, yeah. you know, our, I, I do believe that our industry is one of those, um, those industries that really it always has each other's backs and is always yes. willing to support in any way that they can. Um, and it's so gonna I'm very even, that. it's going to be even more true, um, because this crisis is going to leave, unfortunately, a lot of uh, companies out of business, a lot of restaurants, a lot of bars. And, and I think we will have to show um, in the industry, we'll have to come together and, and help pace the way for a better future. So that's very unfortunate, but it's all over the world. I mean, don't, um, I mean, it's, it's on Europe, it's, it's huge. I mean, we know that some people will never reopen. Um, but I wanted to touch a, a, a word on the, the fact that your community, you know, um, Lauren, you know, right now, a lot of rappers, a lot of people, hip hop industry has done a lot for Cognac, a lot. Oh, uh, yeah. But it, but it dates back, not the, the rappers and not the, um, the hip hop industry, for which I'm very grateful. But um, it started, you know, some people in France always ask me was, why is it that the uh, African American community is enjoying Cognac so much? And it's a very simple explanation that very few people know. Um, during the Vietnam War, a lot of the soldiers were, were African-Americans. And the one that were lucky to survive is in Fino, uh, came back uh, with um, this social um, image of Cognac because Cognac, Vietnam was a former French colony. So Cognac was sent, and particularly by the big names that you're familiar with, and it was consumed because Vietnam, like uh, most of the Far East, is very humid, and it was consumed in long drinks. So when they came back home, they came back with the idea that cognac in cocktail was a natural. It was something that they enjoyed very much so. And that's how the young kids, uh, the young rappers, the young hip hops that you see today, I've seen their grandparents drinking cognac, and they've mm -hmm. enjoyed the, the concept of drinking cognac. So it's not, it's not Jay-Z or it's not, that started this phenomenon. It's, it's really something that was there at the end of the 60s, early 70s, when we saw really that without, without this community, Cognac will never be on the map like it is today. So yeah. every time that I have the opportunity to thank this community, I do. And it's not because it's something that we have to do in those days and day and age. It's because I'm deeply convinced that the cognac industry owes a lot to people that really wanted to drink cognac the way cognac was consumed in the 50s, in the 60s, in Vietnam, in the Far East, and the way it's now very fashionable to drink. Yeah. So in, in long drinks, in, in cocktails. So I think I'm, 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 I'm quite grateful about that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up because I feel like um, we – Unfortunately, it's it's I don't know if it's that we forget our history or that 
there are just parts of it that are untold. But, you know, uh, my grandma was drinking cognac when I was young. And, um, you know, she would she would tell a very similar story. You know, I I watched my parents drink it. And this is just something that I'm accustomed and that I'm used to. And um, it's 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 nice to know that, you know, while promoting this spirit and this brand, that's obviously very close to your heart that you also tell that side of the story, because I do think that it's important for um, people to to be aware of the association, um, mm. not just in present day, but, you know, what the past, um, the past that created the present, right? I am firm be- believer that the past explains the future. Um, when you know the past and avoid the mistakes, so when you know, you, you, you build a better future. And in, in our in our world, in our industry, um, understanding who is drinking what and for what reason makes us really more clever in the way we market our products, in the way we present them, in the way we address the people that drink it, and in the way we offer new ways of enjoying it. So this is what, and these mixologists, with consciously or not, have really recreated the condition of building a successful category. Well, you have to understand it's very unique as a concept that uh, Hennessy, which is absolutely leading the world uh, for our cognac industry, um, is is an amazing uh, marketing machine. You know, they have built an image and they're given, they're, they're leading the way for that. But there are a, a zillion of, not a zillion, but <laughs> uh, very, very nice companies behind that that also can bring their, you know, the, their stone to the wall, as we say to, in France. And it's always nice, you as a customer and the one that are listening to us tonight, to be able to experience something different. And the, the beauty is like you don't always eat the same chicken or the same meat or the same. So it's the same with drinks. I mean, it's it's wonderful to be able to select something that you have never experienced before and, and discover the quality of the product. So this is this is what the mixology has brought back, the value of real good ingredients. And in, in, in very simple things, we like good syrups, uh, uh, good bitters and making, that makes a difference. Good fruits, yeah. because a lot of things are made with fruit and, and fruit liqueurs and that's that makes it that makes it really uh, much better. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit about um, you know obviously the times are a little difficult for 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 most of us I would say um, and yeah. I'm I was hoping that you could kind of um, shed some wisdom on uh, any advice that you might give individuals who are you know a little lost or or just scared or um, just unsure of what to do in regards to being in. Um, being in the food and beverage industry, because I think it is a little bit of a scary time. It is a scary time because you're going to see a lot of people, right now they have been furloughed. You know, I know that some distributors really have furloughed most of their uh, on-premise team, and that's that's scary. Um, I think, I mean, and coming from a dinosaur technology like me, I think the (laughs) e-commerce and the the social media, uh, it's a revolution. It is, it is a complete revolution of the way people consume. Uh, I'm, I'm not buying a lot on, on, I'm talking about clothes or shoes, but my children are. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I like, I still like to go to a store. I like to put a, a pair of shoes on and everything. But for drinks, I am amazed to see that something that did not happen maybe two years ago, people are not afraid now to order through sites, uh, bottles that are delivered to their door. And I think for people that have, um, that, that really want to experiment something, if you have an idea, if you, have a, if you want to create something, a drink or something, don't be shy and go for it because the social network can give you a stage that nobody can give you. Um, you see the, the, the strengths of influencers and you're one of them. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, for me, it's, we, nobody was talking about influencers four or five years ago. Nobody. Yeah, but even that term has changed with um, quarantine. Like what an influencer was before and what it is now is, I think, are two completely different things. Yes. You know, yes. I yes. think an influencer was, you know, a girl at a at a bar or restaurant taking a picture of them holding a pizza or having a cocktail in their hand, and now it's like, 
it's the people who are creating the product and creating the spirits. And, you know, we're really, I think, in a, a great position in that regard mm. to, to really promote the brands and the products yeah. and the, um, the beverages. And I mean, to your point, it really, I, this word is so played out now, but it, it is a major pivot. It's a major change. And I think yes. um, mm. we are in an industry where we are constantly, constantly transforming and changing. And, and uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, think of all the cocktail menus we make, all the oh. themes we come up and concepts we come up for yes. bars, it, yes. it, the interior design that goes into it. Like, so we can do this. And I truly believe that, you know, we might, we might suffer a little bit. We will overcome it and we will be okay. And I, I, I cannot agree more. And coming from somebody that had a very difficult time with, you know, reality which is not mine i was not raised with a mouse on my hand i was not raised with and now to be able to see people like you making cocktails from thousands and thousands miles away and be able to reproduce that at home i think it's 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 a revolution i mean even 10 years ago nobody thought about that the mixology world took took this world by by i mean by storm it's it's absolutely amazing what people can do Tales of the Cocktails really started something when, when they started. And I think they have been, well, except this year when they, they, they could not do it. But uh, it's, it's, it was a revolution, I mean, in some ways, yeah. that you know, telling people what they could do with one product. You know, how many people were used to, to drink their fa favorite drink only one way? Only one way, you know, on ice or something. And now they discover... Uh, I have, I told some of my friends in Cognac, older friends, I said, well, Cognac is mostly consumed now in, in the U.S. In, uh, in cocktails. And they look at me like I'm, uh, <laughs> what is she talking about? And, you know, the, the time where everybody is enjoying a little glass of Cognac in front of a fireplace with your dog on your, on your feet and everything, it is, it is, it still exists, but there are yeah. so many other ways. And I think... In cognac, we were the last of the brown spirits to understand the potential of the young people. We addressed ourselves and we, we pushed ourselves in a corner where people that were drinking cognac were people that knew they know what they were what they were used to. They were they had their favorite brand. That was the only thing. Today, people want to experiment. They want yeah. to do something different, and they want real stories also. This is why this is why you see the resurgence of some old liqueurs, some things that you know. Who was talking? Who was talking about chartreuse ten years ago? Nobody. You couldn't get arrested with it. A and today you see Sue's. You see all these yeah. named fabulous products that that are uh, Guignolet and Dolan and so many things that are absolutely delicious which were totally overlooked because everybody was drinking the big names and, and one category. You were a vodka drinker, period. Well, the vodka drinker now are experimenting that they're trying gin. They're trying yeah. other things, you see? Yeah. And it's the same in the brown spirits. I can tell you that there are more links between cognac, bourbon, and, and single malt that anybody can imagine. I was. I had the pleasure to do some whiskey uh, whiskey fairs, and sometimes you see people that see a table of cognac in those in those things, and they say, "Cognac, you know, very surprised." Yes, cognac is a brandy, but not all brandies are cognacs, of course, because it has to come from our cognac region in France. But they are very surprised. So they have a, a, a really a view of the product which is not at all what cognac is. So the beauty of having an opportunity to present cocktails like you do, Lauren, opens um, to many people who would have never dared to try cognac. Yeah. Uh, when you do a sidecar, very basic sidecar, and you put that in front of a lady, if you don't tell her there is cognac in it, she will say, oh, I've tried that with many friends. Oh, this is delicious. What is it? Yeah. She said it is cognac and everything else. And they say, no, there is no cognac in it. Because that tells you that the product is so versatile that you can use it neat, cocktail. There are so many opportunities to enjoy it. So yeah. uh, this is what I have learned, is that you can never just 
uh, put yourself in a corner and never get out. Uh, cognac, of course, is a digestive. It's a wonderful thing, but it can be so much more. I agree. And, uh, you know, just thinking about cocktails a little bit, as you we were just discussing, you know, I think um, one of the things that is so amazing is uh, the versatility that comes with making it, um, you know, for hearty cognac, it, for instance. And I know that when I'm making cocktails in general, I really like to, um, to create cocktails that I have um, some sort of connection with, right? And, and brands and associate myself with brands that I, I can connect with, whether it's, you know, the story or the people or, or, you know, whatever it may be. And I think this idea of like authenticity and voice and being true to who I am really does translate into how I make my cocktails. I take my time to learn the brand. I take my time to learn about the individuals who are part of the brand. You know, I'm having conversations with the blenders and the distillers and what they were attempting to accomplish when they were creating these spirits. I mean, we spoke before we got on, but you know, uh, when I was first competing in the competition, learning about hearty cognac, marmalade was a flavor that, you know, was intentionally, um, you know, purposefully being heightened. Yeah. And you, you, yeah. you know, I think, tasting it and tasting it and studying it, you realize that. So, you know, doing something like creating a marmalade syrup that has a little coffee and vanilla just heightens the cognac itself so much more. So, you know, if I'm being authentic with my voice and, and how I am with creating cocktails, that, that's just one of the things that I like to do, um, you know, ensure that I'm, I'm doing it justice. And it's really the connection for me. Um, yes. And that's how, yeah. I yeah, cannot but, agree um, more. And I think which is interesting in the variety of products you can work with is that of course you relay more with the one that are very authentic. And, and this is something that I can see uh, in, with a lot of mixologists that are very demanding on the quality of the product that they're using. The story behind it, I mean, the people, as you say, behind it. You would love my blender. It doesn't speak much English, but is very true to the product and is very uh, caring and he knows that we, we have been promoting a certain style for our eau de vies for years, and he's trying to keep that. And he said, I'm just, I'm just relaying my experience for the next one. You know, I'm just preparing the next one, which is, cognac has so much history. And when you come to the city, you will see. Um, we're younger than the Armagnac. Armagnac is probably one of the oldest uh, brandies, uh, at least in France. And, uh, uh, but it's, it's so interesting to see that it started with uh, a double distillation and just using the local ingredients, uh, the vines that were here. And because cognac started because the vine, the wine that we were producing in our region was not as good as the Bordeaux ones, which are not very far from where we are. But the climate was different and our wines were more acidic. So because they were more acidic, they didn't travel very well. Mm -hmm. And so when when the the all the, the the big fleets, you know, the English, the Dutch, the Norwegians were coming to buy food in France, they were always buying wine. And our wines were the ones that were not good to travel a long time at sea. And the distillation process, which was invented um, um, by by the Dutch, uh, perfecting under the name brandy, come from brandvin, which is burned wine in, in Dutch. Um, was really something that really put the, the, the region on the map, no question. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes from little accidents and little experience, you know, from smart people uh, or daring people, daredevils, uh, if that's how it works. And uh, this, is, this is something for me that never ceases to amaze me that people have ideas and they, they use what is produced locally, like the, the, the oak that we're using, which is coming from the center of France. This is the oak we were using to build our ship, you know, our ships. Yeah. And, and, and it became, we don't build ships in wood anymore, but we continue the resource and we continue to plant oaks. And these big oaks are very unique. And when you come, Lauren, because uh, hopefully you will come soon, uh, you will see, and whoever wants to come will be my pleasure to welcome you in our facility. Uh, I will always take you to a cooperage house okay. because there is no good cognac without this amazing friendship and partnership that there is between the blender and the cooperage people. 
because they tell you tell them what you want, how, how deep the toast is, and it makes the whole difference with your cognacs. It, it allows your product to have different profiles. And this is the way you really age cognac, you know, and yeah. using local resources. That's Absolutely. Um, just wanted to let anyone know if you have questions, put them in the, um, the chat on Facebook and we will be sure to answer them. Um, we are, we're coming to a close shortly. So I just want everyone to have an opportunity to, to do that. Um, but, you know, kind of going back to what we were talking about, you know, this idea of intersectionality, advancement, you know, cultural exchange is just that um, I think when I think of these three topics and I relate it to what's happening in current day, uh, it's, it's, I mean, all of these, um, these different positions that we're talking about, the cooperage, right? The, the distillers, the blenders, the, um, distributors, the bartenders, um, they're all very different positions, right? But they, they, they are all pertinent and important to, we all have the same common goal, essentially. We all want to sell the product to the consumer. We all want to provide an experience to the consumer, mm. sell a story. And I think, especially during this time, when we are going to be forced to pivot and to change that our relationships, um, if we don't have them established already, are going to have to change with all of these people. And they're going to have to be stronger. And I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that. That actually excites me. Um, because I do think that there are many good things coming. Um, I, I agree. I agree. And a lot of a lot of communities in the, in your country. Um, you know, I, I was discussing uh, previously about the importance of the African American market for VS cognacs, but you have other communities like the Russian community, like I know in Brooklyn, New York, which um, the Russian love cognac and they do the same thing. I mean, they're they're drinking it differently than African-Americans, but they still enjoy it. And what about the, the, the Asian communities? Uh, so all these people come along together and, and we, we, we sell them different products, but it's still the same pleasure of discovering uh, something really of quality. Cognac is definitely a quality brandy. And when you mix quality, whatever, whatever ingredients you use, quality is what remains. And that's 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 my that has been my fight uh, all these years, um, with combined with the fact that I think that women have a fantastic palate. Um, I know politically incorrectly that children have wonderful palate, and we never say about that too much. But <laughs> I remember my daughter; she was not even twelve, and we were celebrating something at home, and I allowed her to just drop a finger in two glasses, there was an exo cognac and there was a young cognac, but she immediately picked the big one, the, the best one. And she was uh, describing, mom, I can feel it is more luscious on the palate, it's not as strong as the VS. And the word that she were, was using, I was amazed because it was like a professional. And she had never drank anything like that, of course, before, but just tripping her finger. She's an expert on champagne, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Like many like ladies. Your sister, right? Yes, yes. So anyway, that's that's that was a, a wonderful conversation, Lauren. I really yeah. uh, appreciate the opportunity and the pleasure of seeing you. Hopefully, yes. well, for anybody that uh, knows Lauren, when she won the competition, won the uh, a trip to France for two, and she was supposed to come um, last June. Unfortunately, with the situation, most of the restaurants, hotels, and bars, everything was closed. So we had to postpone. And on top of that, the American could not travel much uh, like we cannot travel much. As Otherwise, Eugene. I would have been stuck there. I know. <laughs> well, <laughs> Doesn't sound too yeah, bad to me. Not too bad. We could have found something for you, my dear. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so it's something that, uh, that uh, we encourage. I mean, whoever uh, is willing to come and experience um, something different will be happy to Come and visit us. We'll be delighted to welcome you and show you what uh, what cognac is. And the, the region is delightful. Yeah, I do have one question. Uh, I'm not sure if you can answer it, but I'm hoping you can. So uh, somebody asked if Hardy is available in the Caribbean market. Very, very interesting. Um, we were we were in St. Thomas uh, for a while. Uh, not much, unfortunately. Not much. Uh, something as far as anybody is uh, interesting. I. I have an opportunity maybe to meet somebody that will take care of uh, 
the French Caribbean, uh, Guadeloupe and Martinique. We were with Reese, um, which is a big ship chandler in uh, St. Thomas, but uh, no, we're not really available. You know, in the Caribbean, the market is not ours. The market is really fun for the big boys. But uh, in the U.S., we're mostly available everywhere. Uh, Pennsylvania, not, not because it's a controlled state and it's tough to be, to be there. But all the major, major cities, I mean, the, in Florida, you are in all the ABC stores, uh, Total Wine. I mean, there are so many places. And, of course, independent. A lot of good friends, independents, uh, I've carried my products over the years. Yeah, oh, that's okay. great. Um, I just wanted to, before we conclude, talk a little bit more about this idea of intersectionality. Um, so for, you know, individuals like myself and Benedict, um, we we obviously are two very, very different individuals. You know, I, I um, consider myself an African-American, a woman, um, you know, and uh, it's it's really this idea of just celebrating the areas which, in which we cross over. Um, so uh, very grateful for her mentorship and her friendship because, you know, we've, we've found um, a really great opportunity to celebrate our differences, but also, um, you know, our similarities and, and sure. in that, you know, uh, provide support to not only each other, but to, to other individuals as well. So um, yeah, I, I, you know, I want to thank Portland Cocktail Week for having us and yes. uh, Hardy Cognac for um, allowing me to do this. And it's been really, really fun. And, um, you know, I, I hope that we get to do this again soon in person when it's safe. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it. it will be it will be really something that will be uh, really way overdue. But uh, unfortunately, this this terrible situation I, has brought also some people closer together. I think we have to bond uh, one way or another. We have to bond. And I'm 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 delighted that our industry give us that opportunity like nothing else. I'm not sure you bond as much when you sell washing powder, to be honest with you. But <laughs> Around a nice cocktail with something good in your hand, I'm sure, and in, on your palate, I'm sure that the bond is real. And that it, it allows us from different worlds to connect, which is really yeah. the main thing. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. And for those of you who want to find us um, afterwards, uh, you can check out the Hardy Cognac website or their Instagram. Uh, so it's hardycognac.fr. Uh, uh, and if you'd like to chat with me a little bit more about all things uh, intersectional, um, and, you know, advancement and um, all that lovely things, you can follow me at fohealth.org. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us, Benedict. And Thank uh, you. Thank you, everybody. Us. Thank you for yeah. being here. And uh, well, it's time for me to uh, close my office and <laughs> go back to my family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank all you. Right. Thank Have you a all. good night. You Take too. Care, everyone. Have, a, have a good day for you. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.